Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to this week's Keeping an Eye on the Geopolitical Ball with me, Jamie Shea, Senior Fellow at Friends of Europe. Well, the EU High Representative for the Common Foreign and Security Policy, Joseph Borrell, is a very busy man these days, but this time last week, uh, he took a day off to go to Bruges to inaugurate the new European Diplomatic Academy. Uh, the EU has lots of diplomats. If you count the European External Action Service uh, and also all of those diplomats that work for the 27 uh, EU member states in embassies and missions and representations on all Five continents, the EU has nearly 70,000 diplomats. You would think that that would be a good enough service to give Joseph Borrell all of the advice that he needs. But <laughs> interestingly, he began his speech by excoriating uh, EU diplomats, saying that they didn't give him the quality of analyses he was looking for, uh, and that he learned more and better uh, from reading the newspapers or uh, NGO reports. So clearly this new European Diplomatic Academy is going to have its work cut out to remedy that situation. But Borrell also used his speech to uh, present a rather gloomy uh, picture of, of the world uh, beyond the EU shores. He described the EU as a garden surrounded by a jungle, of course, with the uh, implication that the jungle could quickly spread uh, onto the garden. Now, this is not a new metaphor. Uh, many years ago, a, a well-known uh, EU former EU official and British diplomat uh, Robert Cooper also used the jungle analogy and even implied in terms of the rule of law in Poland and Hungary that the jungle was inside the EU uh, already. But, but certainly Burrell's speech does mark a kind of shift to the right in terms of the EU moving from a community originally designed to secure the prosperity of its citizens, now more to secure their protection and security. L'Europe qui protège, to quote uh, President Macron. Now, this uh, more gloomy view of the outside world, uh, of course, has been very much uh, instigated by the 2008 uh, global financial crisis, the sense that globalization is now in reverse, the uh, post-COVID uh, emphasis on reducing dependencies in energy or raw materials on foreign powers who could try to blackmail you, uh, as Russia has clearly been doing over gas uh, since the, uh, its invasion of uh, Ukraine. Uh, uh, the growing alarm about uh, the readiness of states to use military force, the fact that we're seeing in Ukraine, of course, the first total war in Europe uh, since 1945, the sense of fragility in the EU uh, since uh, the UK left uh, uh, after the Brexit referendum, uh, the worries about the constancy of American engagement during the Trump administration, and uh, so on uh, and so forth. Uh, it's a marked contrast from 20 odd years ago when uh, if I went into a bookstore in London, the shelves were full of books uh, uh, predicting that the rest of the world uh, admired so much the EU model of cooperation and pooling sovereignty that everybody wanted to be an EU country. Now it's clear to people like Joseph Burrell that no, not everybody wants to be an EU country, quite the reverse. And therefore, uh, to some degree, uh, security has become uh, as important as stability. Freedom has become uh, even more important uh, than peace. There is a sense that the EU has to defend its values much more robustly if it wants to keep them. Uh, now, last week, I was at a conference in Berlin where uh, the Latvian defense minister, Pabrix, was one of the speakers, and he said that EU states needed to adopt a total defense concept, spending as much as 3% of their GDP on defense, as Latvia aspires to do, uh, and basically uh, being ready to die for their country. Uh, this is not language that we've heard in the EU uh, ever before. But over the last couple of months, we have seen the EU taking an increasingly tough stance vis-a-vis -vis the rest of the world. For example, uh, the External Action Service recently published a report on China recommending, I quote, a realistic and robust engagement and being less naive about China or the prospects for economic cooperation. The EU has imposed uh, uh, so far 
uh, seven packages of sanctions uh, against Russia. The European uh, peace facility uh, has been almost spent uh, totally uh, with its 5.5 billion euros uh, assisting Ukraine. Another 500 million was given to Ukraine by EU foreign ministers this week. Uh, and the EU decided to set up a training mission in France, uh, in Germany and Poland, excuse me, to train 15,000 Polish soldiers. Uh, at a NATO meeting uh, just last week, uh, European ministers agreed to a German proposal, 15 uh, EU countries will participate, to create a sky shield to integrate their uh, uh, air and missile defence systems to protect their skies. The EU has been tough on Iran, imposing a new package of sanctions this week uh, after the repression of the women's civil rights uh, movement and threatening sanctions against Iran if it's proved, as I think it will be, that Iran has been uh, uh, transferring drones and missiles to Russia. Uh, we've seen the EU also get tough when it comes to critical infrastructure protection and start looking about at how together it can better protect underwater cables and pipelines and energy platforms against the kind of sabotage that we saw recently in the Baltic against the Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2 pipelines. I, I've also noticed that uh, recently the EU's external operations, which used to be largely about supervising elections or uh, providing humanitarian aid, have been much more geared to the EU strategic interests, fighting terrorism in Mozambique or, or, or the Sahel or Mali, um, the Ukraine mission, which I just referred to. Uh, and uh, just a couple of days ago, the EU launched a new monitoring mission uh, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, which have been, as you know, fighting uh, on and off for several years uh, already. And then the big push on energy with capping the gas price, with the Commission proposal to bulk buy gas on behalf of EU member states, uh, the reduction of dependency on Chinese rare earths and so on. In Berlin, I heard from some German industrialists that they buy up to 95% of all of their rare earths from China. Now, the EU clearly is learning the language of power. But at the Kober Stiftung uh, European Policy Forum in Berlin this week, we also learned of a new poll carried out by Kober, which showed that public opinion isn't necessarily following this Zeitung vendor, this change of the times, as the Germans like to call it. For example, 52% wanted uh, a more restrained German foreign policy, 65% preferred diplomacy over military instruments, they only received 15% support. Uh, and clearly, there, there was a sense that uh, uh, what we see in uh, Central uh, and Western Europe doesn't necessarily correspond to the much more alarmist uh, mood uh, with the total defense concept that we see in countries like Poland and the Baltic states. So European political leaders are going to have a tough job to bring uh, public opinion behind them, uh, towards this, uh, behind this more robust uh, EU foreign policy. Policy. The other thing, of course, is that it very much depends on France and Germany working together. Uh, but this week, uh, we learned that uh, France and Germany have decided to postpone until January an important summit that Chancellor Scholz and uh, President Macron were due to hold uh, because France is unhappy uh, that Germany is buying American military equipment like F-35 aircraft and air defense rather than French or European systems, and that Germany is subsidizing uh, its consumers uh, uh, with gas uh, uh, subsidies without consulting France and so on and so forth. So on energy and defence, they're still far apart. A so it's good that the EU is speaking the language of power. Uh, but of course, uh, number one, it has to bring those capabilities behind that concept. Uh, and number two, it, it has to be mindful, of course, that the EU's uh, traditional approach uh, is not to see the rest of the world as hostile, but to engage with it. And so getting that balance between defence and protection vis-a-vis -vis engagement right is going to be key. The EU made a positive start in that direction also recently in Prague in establishing a European political community to reach out to all of its neighbours who perhaps consider themselves part of the jungle but I would hope uh, can still be considered as future members of the garden. Thank you for watching, for listening today, look forward to engaging with you next week.